everybody. Um, so this is kind of a, a specific, I guess, presentation. Um, it, we've seen a lot of tile drainage go in uh, on into irrigated land over the last four or five years, and uh, you know, trying to address waterlogged soils or poorly drained soils or saline soils. Um, so I just wanted to touch a little bit on the water management side once that tile's gone in. Um, because it, it takes more than just installing the tile. There comes, you know, you have to adjust your water management or have specific water management with that in order to really uh, see the benefits of, of the tile in, in that investment. Um, so first off, who all out there has installed tile on their land and irrigates? Okay, so there's, there's one of you, so Jeff, I made, I made this presentation specifically for you. Uh, but um, I think a lot of the concepts uh, apply, you know, across the board or, you know, if you are considering uh, looking at doing some drainage improvements, uh, these are some considerations to uh, uh, give some thought to as well. Uh, so first off, I'm just going to provide a bit of an overview of salinity, uh, you know, that background. And talk about irrigation and leaching concepts. Um, talk about some of the agronomics and logistics, logistical considerations, and then provide some examples from CSIDC. That's the research farm just on the other town where we uh, got a number of fields of pad tile installed over the years. So first off, what is salinity? Anybody? Salinity. Salt. Salts in, it's just a measurement of salts in your soil. So the main salts that we have in our soil are uh, sulfate based salts. We don't really have a lot of chloride salts in our soil, it's mainly in Saskatchewan, particularly around here, sulfate, so magnesium sulfate, sodium sulfate, calcium sulfate. Uh, sodium sulfate's maybe a little bit more of a, a concern. If you have highly sodic soils, there can be some impacts on soil uh, permeability, and I'll get into that a little bit further on. So also, how is salinity measured? Uh, the, kind of the universal measurement, or it's electrical conductivity, decisiemens per meters, that's kind of the units we would measure salinity with. Uh, there's different ways of, of measuring salinity in the field or in your soil. You can go out, take a soil sample, um, and send that sample to a lab and you get a, uh, an extract done on it. So the saturated paste, it's a type of soil extract it's done, that's kind of universal measurement. And I just wanted to point that out just because a lot of labs, they'll do different sac or, or different extraction uh, methods. So a lab uses a one to one or, or two to one, which is two parts water to one part soil extraction method. Uh, you'll get a little bit different. They'll report the EC back to you in your soil test, but it'll, it's not a direct comparison to the saturated paste. So that's just something to be aware of. Uh, and then uh, Jay mentioned in the field, we'll measure salinity with EM38s or Ferris. Uh, they're just conductivity meters. It can rapidly read the bulk conductivity of the soil, so you can get a uh, good, if you go out, have it hooked up with a GPS, you can get a, <coughs> capture a lot of data in a big hurry and, and develop a detailed salinity map of that field based on that data. Uh, with these, it's measuring the bulk conductivity, so it's not just salinity that influences the conductivity of the soil, clay content, moisture, temperature, those are all impact your readings. So you always want to take some background soil samples just to verify what you're reading in the field. Uh, so again, with measuring salinity, the different uh, ratings that we have, uh, zero to two deci siemens per meter is non-saline, two to four slightly saline. Uh, so that's where you might see in dry years, yields start to decrease, but generally not a concern. 48, that's where you're getting into moderately saline soils. Uh, there's reduced crop productivity with most crops in these areas. Um, particularly, again, in dry years, you might start to see um, reduced emergence, lower stand counts in these areas, so your yield potential right off the get-go is, is lower. Uh, severely saline, that's 8, eight to 16 decimals per meter. Uh, that's where you really start to see the salinity uh, in the field. Um, limited amount of emergence in these areas, so reduced stand counts. This is where you start to see kochia and other uh, salt tolerant species start taking over in the field. You see white crusting on the surface. So those are, are really problematic from an agronomic standpoint. And then very severely saline. Basically, 
you know, if you're dealing with that, that, that land has zero value essentially from an egg, uh, egg standpoint. So we, we do measure uh, salinity in-house with the M38 with uh, J in, in that unit. And this is the CSIDC research station. So every five years we go out and map that station just to watch for salinity, salinity trends. Mm -hmm. So some of you are familiar with our salinity maps. Mm -hmm. Basically what you're looking at here is where there's white, that's non-saline, yellow slightly saline, blues moderately saline areas, reds uh, in the severely saline area. So you can see at the center we do have um, some salinity issues that we're dealing with. And, and I'll get into that a little bit more later on. So mechanisms behind salinization, there's two fundamental conditions that cause soil salinity to occur. You have to have a water table that's close enough to the soil surface. Uh, the water will move up through capillary action and with it, it's bringing salts. This chart here shows water table. So if you have a water table that's, uh, I think that's uh, roughly three meters, uh, you can see how far the, the salts will move up in the profile. So this is conductivity, this is depth, and this is kind of your salt profile. So, and, and the two different lines, one's showing a line where you have groundwater that's non-saline, and the other showing a line where you have a saline groundwater. So you can, can kind of see that when you have a water table that's at about uh, two and a half to three meters, your your salt bulge is, is at about a meter and a half. So it's really outside of your root zone. Evan's shaking his head, he doesn't, doesn't agree. Oh, I you agree? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so when you're, this, this next one, your water table is at 1.8 meters. You can start seeing where the, the salt bulge is now getting up to close to about a meter. So 1.8 meters is, is uh, three or five to six feet roughly. So that's, you know, you're getting into the root zone. So once your water table hits around two meters, that becomes a bit of a concern. The bottom one, your water table is at a meter. So three feet, that's now bringing salts right to the surface. So if you have a water table that's within three feet of the surface, that's, that's definitely a cause of concern. So other fundamental conditions for salinization is you have uh, a climate where evapotranspiration exceeds precipitation. So this just means there's a net upward movement of water from the water table. Um, and with it, it's bringing salts, water is evaporating, transpiring, and salts are deposited, they're left behind and, and accumulated uh, near the soil surface. Uh, so this is just showing some different um, schematics for, for what is the cause of high water table. So you can have a high water table can be influenced everything from a regional area. So you might have uh, your recharge areas uh, could be you know 10 miles from your field, but that's causing your you know some artesian pressure under underneath your field um, to very localized influence. Uh, and this was James' example where you know you have a, a slough in your field and that's causing the water table to mound and there you drown it and then you start to get that evaporative rain of salt to build up around around the slough area. So, um, so anyways, just just considerations like if you're looking at um, coming up with a management plan, if you're looking at tile drainage, it's important to know what is what's causes that high water table and, and that will ultimately influence how you design and design that field. And so this is where I got a little bit artistic and spent about an hour and a half putting this, this next little piece together. So this is my simplified schematic of tile plus leaching. So this is your water table, it's close enough to the surface, water's moving up, salts are, are depositing. Um, so now you introduce tile, you're lowering the water table, so you're getting that under control. Next, you have irrigation, so now you have ability to apply more water than what is uh, transpiring or evaporating from the surface. So you have a net downward movement of, of water and with that you're able to leach salts downwards and not cause uh, further groundwater uh, problems by applying, you know, you don't have the tile in there and you start applying more water than what's transpiring, you know, your water table is just going to continue to rise and, and become very problematic that way. So, so salt removal by leaching depends on uh, these different factors. And this was actually pulled together by Terry Hogg back when he was out at CSIDC. So just basically stole this slide from him. 
Um, so quantity of water passing through the soil, that's very important. Uh, it takes a lot of leaching water to, to leach those salts downwards. The depth of the soil to be reclaimed, initial salinity level of the soil, types of salts present, and then soil texture, structure, uh, permeability, infiltration rate. So those are all kind of um, tied together. Texture, structure, you know, all will impact permeability, infiltration rates of the soil. Uh, so this actually, if you don't take anything else from, from my presentation today, just take that it takes a lot of water to, to leach the salts downwards. It's not gonna be one or two inches and your soil's reclaimed. Um, the rule of thumb is to decrease salinity in one foot of soil by 50%, you would need six inches of leaching water applied through that soil. So, um, so if you have an EC in your top foot of eight, and you wanna bring that down to four, well, you're gonna to have to put at least six inches of water through that. So that's dealt with your top foot. Now your second foot, you know, your root zone is gonna be three to four feet. So, uh, you know, if you go from eight to four, well, four is still into moderately saline soil. So now you wanna take it down another 50%, uh, then get it down to 20% of the original salinity content. You have to apply a foot of water through there. So again, a lot of water has to go through these soils in order to uh, see an improvement. So the depth of soil to be reclaimed. So this is just a chart that shows your root zone of, of most plants. You know, 40% uh, of your roots, of your water uptake is in the top 25% of the root zone. 30% is in the next 25%. Most, most crops have a root zone of three to four feet. So, you know, we, focus really on those top two feet, not 70% of your root zone. So that's really, if you're looking at trying to desalinize that soil, you wanna uh, get down to at least two feet, preferably three feet of, of, uh, of, uh, of improving the soil condition. So types of salt present, I mentioned before, we have magnesium sulfates, sodium sulfates, calcium sulfates, uh, all of them are, are slightly have different solubilities, so they'll all leach out at different rates. And so again, you want to watch that that sodium. So you might want to take some soil samples, uh, get send them off to the lab, see what's happening to your SAR. Because if you get a disproportionate amount of sodium in relation to calcium and magnesium, then you can start having some uh, soil structure breakdown. Sodium disperses clay particles, breaks down soil structure then you know, as that structure breaks down, it seals off soil pores, reduces permeability, so that causes uh, you know, you know, further problems that way. Um, yeah, so, so soil permeability, just infiltration rates, hydraulic conductivity, it's all influenced by texture, structure, compaction, so if you have a heavy clay soil, it might get compacted, you might have reduced permeability. So again, you, know, you wanna consider those things uh, when you're you know, looking at uh, developing a reclamation plan or a water management plan for the soils. So loamy sand, sandy loam soils have high infiltration rates, water moves fairly quickly through those soils. Clay loams, heavier textured soils, slower infiltration rates, water's gonna move a lot slower through those. So that's gonna impact how much water you can get on in a, in a given period. Uh, again, structure is another thing to consider. So, you know, uh, single grain or, or granular soil structure, the water will move relatively quickly through black yeast, even you know, prismatic structure, again, water moves reasonably well through there. Um, but once you get into clay, you're, you're massive, and this is generally where you have, uh, again, clay soils, reduced structure, water is gonna really move slowly through those soils. So it's gonna really impact your ability to uh, apply water um, and leach those soils. Now I'll move on to just some general agronomic and logistical considerations. Um, so your leaching season, this was taken from Brent Patterson. He, he pulled together a, a document and uh, I have a few copies at the back, but uh, your leaching season is really, you know, if you look at March, April, May, uh, frozen soils, snow melt, you might get a little bit of leaching occurring <coughs> naturally from the snow melt. You don't have irrigation until the middle of May, probably. Um, and then, you know, you're gonna to wanna to focus on the crop and not leaching necessarily, right? You've applied fertilizer, you've applied a lot of nitrogen fertilizer, 
you don't want to be leaching that downwards. It's going to you know, impact the productivity of the, the crop that you're doing. So you're not going to be doing a lot of leaching through the general irrigation season, focus more on crop health. Uh, then you get into July, August, crops using a lot of moisture, so not a lot of leaching is going to happen then. Uh, if you're lucky, you get your crop off end of August or September. So that leaves you with about a month to actually apply water, uh, leaching water. So, so that's another important consideration is you have that month of September really is, is going to be your primary leaching season. Uh, other considerations with regards to if you're installing tile in saline areas, chances are you're not going to put tile underneath the whole pivot, you're going to focus on specific areas. Um, but unless you have variable rate irrigation where you can specifically apply water to those specific areas, it might cause some logistical challenges for you uh, as well. You, you know, if you over irrigate the areas in the fall, if you're putting two or three inches down in the fall on areas that don't have tile and you get water sitting there, well, that's going to be potentially problematic in the spring. Uh, and also from a nutrient management standpoint, you know, anytime you're leaching these non-saline areas, you're leach, leaching nitrogen down, uh, you're losing uh, valuable fertility as well. Uh, so, so if you do install tile and you have saline soils, and this applies to, you know, even without, um, I, I guess, instances where you have um, installed tile. But just generally, if you're dealing with saline soils, the best crops for, for growing in saline areas, barley's got a high salt tolerance, uh, canola's got a relatively good salt tolerance. So those are the crops that are gonna do the best um, in saline areas. So if you have a field with varying levels of salinity, maybe, you know, giving some consideration to, uh, you know, Say you got 30 acres of, of salinity that you're dealing with, maybe you know take that out of um, annual crop production. Consider putting in forage, and maybe just growing barley in that area. Uh, but again, you know those moderate to severely saline areas probably aren't going to be good fits for potatoes, dry beans, some of the more sensitive crops. And and this is just after crops been established. Or the only reason I included this one is. Because it shows that alfalfa has relative poor uh, tolerance to salinity when it's getting established, but once it's established, it has a fair tolerance and is actually a good fit in saline areas because it's going to again draw the water table down, allow you to do some leaching. Um, so to get alfalfa established, you know your root, your uh, seed bed is about you know your top two inches, so if you can. Get some water on, desalinize that uh, seed bed, get your alfalfa established, it might be a, a good fit for some of these soils as well. So some other general agronomic considerations, zero tillage when dealing with saline soils is always a, a good fit. Uh, if you have uh, a good layer of trash, organic matter built up, it kind of insulates the, the soil surface from direct evaporative losses, uh, it prevents, you know, um, Salt's moving right up to the soil surface. Uh, manure is always a good fit because manure will help add organic matter, help with building soil structure, add some fertility. Uh, variable rate, so if you know the salinity across your landscape, across your field, you know you might want to decrease fertility in saline areas, increase seed rates in saline areas just to get better establishment in those areas. Uh, Pre-seed irrigation, so it's looking like it might be a dry spring in our area. Uh, if we don't get any moisture in April, it might be something to consider, particularly if you if you have saline soils, you can put a half inch of water on, you know, get a little bit more water into that seed bed, decrease the salinity status in, in that top two inches of soil. It might be something to consider. Uh, and then when you're actually, you know, you have tile and you're applying leaching water, always monitor your drains. Make sure that that water's coming out. You don't want to apply three or four inches of water in the fall and then find out that that water didn't actually come out where it was supposed to. So now some examples from CSIDC. So there's actually three fields that I'll talk about. So field 11 is, is the famous field that's uh, kind of our shining star example. Center, it's right, right off the highways and driving to town. Uh, field 12, we just recently installed some tile a couple of years ago. And then this middle field, field 4-5, has tile on it as well. 
So the Field 11, uh, Kyle was installed back in the mid 80s. Uh, the field was, when the center was initially developed, it was all under flood irrigation. So at that time, they converted it from flood to put a linear sp overhead sprinkler system on that field. And after the tile was installed, they seeded barley and intensively leached it for seven straight years. So when I say intensively leached, this is the amount of water that they applied. So 170 millimeters in 1987, in the fall of 87, that's leaching water. Uh, 1988, they applied 485 millimeters. So that's over a foot and a half of water went through the soil in that field in, in that one year. Uh, and then gradually it reduced over time. So you can see the average EC prior to tile installation and leaching. The average EC in the top two feet was over eight, so that's severely saline. After the two years of leaching, they brought it down to below three. So now they got it down into the slightly saline area. And after um, three years, they got it down below two, so now it's non-saline. And it kind of fluctuated over time, and, and that will happen. So it's another thing to think about is once you potentially reclaim that field, you know, salts are gonna keep moving up and down with water. So just make sure you're, you're watching that. You might have to uh, have an ongoing leaching uh, program for that field. So field 12, this is where we had some tile installed in the spring of 2017. Uh, the last two years it's been seeded to wheat. Uh, the fall of 2017, Barry indicated they put about 250 millimeters millimeters sorry, of water on but this field also has a bit of a slope to it so a lot of that water just ran off into this depression and so we don't know exactly how much water actually went through the soil there uh, fall of 2018 i wasn't able to get the numbers from them it wasn't as much so we we've been mapping this field so pre uh, tile last the fall of 2017 fall of 2018 so it, can't really see a lot of change based on these maps. It looks like maybe the moderately saline area is decreasing a little bit. Uh, this non-saline area looks a little bigger in this map as compared to this map and this map. Um, but we also took benchmark soil samples and that's where we really saw that there, there is a positive uh, response happening here. So we have one sample up in the dry land corner uh, this is just the top foot. We have soil samples down to four feet, but it's a lot of data and it gets confusing to look at all in one slide. So uh, top foot in the dry land corner went from an EC of just below eight to now it's above 12. So it's really jumped up over the last two years, which kind of can be expected. 2016 was a really wet year and now 17, 18 have been dry years. So that's generally what happens uh, in that wet dry cycle is um, when you move from a wet cycle to a dry cycle, you generally see uh, soil salinity increase in dry land areas where, where water table has risen. Um, so underneath the pivot where the tile has been installed uh, in this sample 25 in a moderately saline sample, we went from eight down to below six. Uh, we had a severely saline sample where uh, we went from above 12 down to again below six. So we saw a really marked improvement there. And then we had a non-saline and a slightly saline sample. And it didn't really see much, much change uh, in those two samples, but really not a concern just because, you know, if you're non-slightly saline, you're really not having much impact in the salts. Anyways, the, the last field I'll talk about, field four or five. So I mentioned we, we monitor the, these fields every five years. So back in the fall of 2012, this field four or five looked good, mainly non slightly saline. Then we went out in 17 and saw a really significant increase in moderate, you know, the area that's impacted by moderate salinity. Uh, again, that was after 16 wet year, 17, uh, we went into a bit of a dry year. Not entirely sure what happened here, uh, but last fall, you know, after we saw that, last fall they did intensively leach this. And again, I asked for the numbers. All I could get was from Greg Larson that they basically drained the broader reservoir through this field. <laughs> so we know that there's a lot of water applied to this field, probably, you know, close to a foot of water. And 
just in that year, we saw a really significant improvement again in that, in that field. So. With that, that's kind of the summary. So again, I just you know wanted to make the point that install the tile. You know there is a water management program that goes with that. And um, Brent Patterson uh, from Alberta, he used to be with uh, Alberta Agriculture, uh, drainage engineer, and actually the executive director with their irrigation group for a number of years. But he's since retired and he's doing some consulting, and he pulled together this document for the irrigation districts in, in Southern Alberta on the reclamation and management guidelines for irrigated class five our lands. And so it, it covers a lot of what I talked about today and, and it's a really good document. So if it's something of interest, we have a couple copies at the back. I think a couple people have already dropped a few copies. And if you didn't get a copy and would like one, just let me know and we can print some more off. Any questions? Okay, everybody's hungry. That's right. Thanks, Kelly. We're under, we are running a little bit ahead.